Our next two speakers, Edward Cameron of BSR and Matthew Rutter of Ernst & Young, have joined us at the panel table. Um, they will each present their special reports and then they'll discuss their topics with each other, much as we just did in the, in the previous panel. And they'll also answer your questions, so again, remember those index cards. Um, first, it's my pleasure to introduce Edward Cameron, who is Director of Partnership Development and Research for BSR. Edward leads research about global megatrends that will affect sustainability and business opportunities. And he also works to identify and address climate resilience issues. Edward will report about business in a climate-constrained world. And he will discuss potential solutions to these challenges. And Matthew Rutter is manager of climate change and sustainability services for Ernst & Young. EY. Matt develops sustainability strategies through analysis of metrics that measure social, environmental, and economic impacts. Matt is going to talk about the value of assurance readiness, an emerging field for both corporate responsibility and investor relations. And with that, I turn it over to Edward. Thank you very much and uh, good morning everybody. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the generous invitation to BSR to come and be with you today and speak to you about our work. I'm going to speak for approximately 15 minutes. For those of you who cannot possibly endure or have the stamina for 15 minutes, there's a basic message behind this uh, presentation and that is essentially that the time has come for us to understand climate risk and the time has come for us to build resilience. And I want to say from the outset that these words, risk and resilience, have been very common in our discussion so far throughout the morning. And I'd like, if you will, to take a mental leap with regards to how we understand the word resilience. In traditional theory, resilience means the ability to rebound from a shock. I think we need to move beyond that very narrowing definition and think of resilience instead as the ability to prosper in a changing world. Because what climate change does more than anything else is it brings changes to business, to society, to the way in which we operate in a climate constrained world. So throughout this presentation, as I use the word resilience, please bear in mind that I'm not simply talking about the ability to respond to a shock. I'm talking about the ability to prosper in a changing world. So, the first part of this presentation is really about the risk element. And I want to say from the outset that we at BSR have decided to embrace this issue of business in a climate constrained world for two reasons. Essentially, the first reason is because the demand is coming from our members. We work with more than 260 multinational uh, corporations across four different continents with offices in eight different cities. And so our reach is global. The membership is working in a global environment. And the first reason we began to work on this issue is because our membership began to demand greater action on it. And I'm personally thrilled about this uh, because I am a climate change specialist myself. I'm also, as you can probably hear from my accent, an Irishman. And it was an Irish scientist who actually identified and discovered climate change as a phenomenon more than 160 years ago. So this is literally not rocket science, it's actually pre-rocket science. And it's wonderful that we're now having this conversation in 2014 about how we address climate risk and build resilience, but it is a conversation that is a long time coming. And once we get over this initial need to great, have greater understanding about the issue, it is going to be crucially important for us to begin to move forward with urgency and ambition. Fortunately, our members are beginning to see this. So last year, for example, we conducted a survey, as we do every year, with our members to identify with them the key sustainability trends that they are seeing. In 2013, they identified human rights as being the key sustainability issue they would need to address. And in 2014, they said that climate change would be the biggest issue that they would need to address. And there are two fundamental reasons for this. The first is because climate change is beginning to become a daily reality for them. They're beginning to see climate change affecting their supply chains. They're beginning to have demands coming not only from traditional suspects in civil society, but also, as we heard earlier, from those in the investor community and from other businesses that they collaborate with. And, of course, on top of that, they see that a window of opportunity has opened 
for governmental action on climate change as a consequence of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fifth Assessment Report, which was published late last year and early this year, and also, of course, the momentum towards an international agreement on climate that will be signed in Paris at the end of next year. So there is a greater awareness of climate as an issue for them, and there's a greater awareness of this rising on the political agenda and coming their way. So the first reason we decided to tackle this issue was demand for membership. The second reason why we decided to tackle this issue is because we have a responsibility to our members to actually table issues and to advance issues and to help them understand not just what they need to be tackling today, but where sustainability is going to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now so that they can preempt some of these problems and begin already to leapfrog to some of the solutions. So as a consequence of understanding ourselves that this was an issue and also wanting to respond to the demand from our membership, we initiated a new strategic focus for the organisation around the issue of business in a climate constrained world. And this essentially outlines a three-year strategy for us as an organisation for how we will engage with members and how we will also facilitate engagement between our corporate members and the various other stakeholders that we work with across civil society, government and multilateral organisations. The heart of this strategy is that we're presenting now two paths for the future. One path leads to greater risk as a consequence of ignoring the implications of climate change. The other path leads to greater resilience the ability to seize on opportunities in a new climate constrained world. So what we're trying to do with this initial strategy is to prevent an empowering framework for corporations across a full suite of industry clusters to begin to understand risk and build resilience. So what does risk essentially mean in the context of climate change? For many years I've been talking about three collision courses that I see on the horizon as a consequence of our failure to deal with climate change with urgency and ambition. The first collision course is that cumulative greenhouse gas emissions coupled with our continuous emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are changing the climate system. They are leading to a variety of climate hazards. We're seeing an increase in intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. We're seeing rising temperatures. We're seeing acidification of our oceans. We're seeing changes in the distribution of water, with some places experiencing inundation and flooding, and other places experiencing greater drought. So all of these hazards are now becoming more and more prominent and more and more intense as a consequence of growing greenhouse gas emissions. The concentration of greenhouse gas emissions traditionally came from the industrialized world. We're now seeing, of course, emerging economies in the developing world catching up and even on a year-to-year -year basis exceeding those emissions in the industrialized world. So this is a growing problem, the creation of hazards. We see those hazards then translated into a second collision course, essentially the collision course with socio-ecological systems. So for example, as a consequence of acidification of the oceans, we're seeing coral reef systems breaking down, which is a tragedy for the coral reef systems, but it's an even bigger tragedy for the oceans and for the people who rely on the oceans, because 25% of all marine life relies on coral reef systems. That means they go to the coral reef systems for food. If the food system breaks down, of course it's difficult for them to survive and thrive. Similarly, the coastal communities who depend on fisheries and other ecosystem services from the oceans begin to lose livelihoods as a consequence of this. We see, for example, from extreme weather events, enormous destruction and fragmentation of ecosystems, but also similar effects on human systems. Climate-induced displacement, for example, with people losing their homes and being forced to migrate. The destruction of utilities and infrastructure as a consequence of storms. No need, of course, for us to remind ourselves in this room as to what happened as a consequence of Hurricane Sandy. The interesting part about all of this, however, is that an extreme weather event in the context of the United States is a relatively minor blip in terms of disruption and in terms of economic loss. But if you look in developing countries, it can be massive. Hurricane Ivan in Grenada, for example, some years ago, resulted in the loss of 120% of GDP. Similarly, the hurricane that hit the Philippines a number of years ago resulted in massive climate-induced displacement. There are 50 million Bangladeshis living less than a metre above sea level right now. Climate predictions tell us that the waters will rise by that amount by the end of this century. Where will those 50 million Muslims go? they will go into neighbouring Hindu India, which already has intercommunal strife between the Muslim and Hindu population. So we are talking about serious socio-ecological risks as a consequence 
of these hazards. And then the third collision course that we're talking about is the one for business. And this is the one that has been a slow burner. We're now beginning to see business understand these risks far more than was the case a number of years ago. But there's all manner of risks that business is now facing as a consequence. Some of them relate to operational risk, danger imposed on vital infrastructure, whether it's roads or ports, dangers imposed on facilities, factories, for example, risks in the supply chain, particularly risks related to the workforce, but also, of course, risks related to access to vital natural resources, and vital commodities. Coca-Cola is a company that is built essentially on water and sugar. Both of those things are seriously at risk as a result of climate. And then of course there is financial and reputational risk, some of which comes from a failure to act on climate change. We're seeing more and more movement towards divestment. We're seeing more and more stakeholder pressure being applied to corporate boards as a consequence of perceived inaction on climate change. And of course we're having a very live discussion right now about the possibility of stranded assets. In other words, what do we do if we cannot take those fossil fuels currently in the ground, out of the ground, as a consequence of climate regulation? And that is particularly live this week, of course, as a consequence of the President's announcement on coal-fired power plants. So you see financial risks, operational risks, reputational risks, natural resource risks, a complete spread across a variety of different issue areas that now need to be taken seriously. And we're beginning to see people take this seriously, but we need now greater urgency and ambition. Within BSR's own membership, for example, we've identified that only about 11% of our members are acting with what we would define as true ambition on climate change. So it's our priority over the coming years to greatly enhance the volume of companies who are working with ambition. And the way in which we're going to do that is to help persuade them of two vital parts of this puzzle, two sides to the same coin when it comes to tackling the issue of climate. The first is that we must work together to avoid the unmanageable, and the second is we must work together to manage the unavoidable. What does that mean in practice? The first means that if we truly want to be resilient, we've got to aggressively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason for that is because as emissions rise, the nature of change itself changes. If we continue on our current emissions pathway, we may end up with four degrees Celsius rises by the end of this century. Very, very different socio-ecological consequences than, for example, if we hold temperature rises to two degrees Celsius by the end of this century. So the first thing we must do is reduce emissions with urgency in order to avoid changes that are unmanageable. For example, food production becomes extremely difficult beyond three degrees Celsius for most of the major crops that we depend upon today for food around the world. The second issue, however, is that in addition to trying to avoid unmanageable climate change, we must recognize that it's already happening before our very eyes. Whether it's extreme weather events on the East Coast, whether it's pest inv infestation in, in the Rocky Mountains, whether it's drought in Texas and California. We're already seeing these changes taking place before our very eyes, and as a consequence, we must factor these changes into our decision-making immediately. This is not an issue anymore that can be put off to tomorrow. It's an issue that we should have dealt with yesterday and absolutely must deal with today. So this central conversation that we're having with all of our members right now is that action is required on both of these issues. And we're saying that that action can be facilitated by concentrating on three things. The first is translation. The climate community for which I am a part has done an absolutely dreadful job of translating climate into actionable insights for business. Too much is written by scientists for other scientists or by people with public sector expertise for other public sector specialists. Not enough has been written in a way that speaks to the specific vocabulary of business. Even something as simple as talking about climate with a 30 or 40 year time horizon. Somebody said to me recently that the average life expectancy of a CEO is six years. And of course that CEO has to report on profits every quarter. So talking to that person about what the world will look like in 2030 is not necessarily the best way of encouraging them to act when there's all manner of different incentives. So translating this issue so that it is truly actionable and speaks to the necessities of business is something we have failed to do and something we must now correct. Second of all, we must facilitate greater collaboration. We have found, for example, that the best work we do on sustainability within BSR is when we can get companies to collaborate across industry sectors. So, for example, we've put together collaborative initiatives that bring together those who use fuel, the owners of large vehicle fleets, with those who produce the fuel. 
in order to have a conversation about what a better fuel product looks like. And we find that that cross-industry collaboration enables us to harvest lessons, enables us to source solutions, but also eliminates the mistrust and rivalry that can sometimes happen when you encourage similar companies and similar industries to work together. And we're also seeing the necessity, of course, to encourage business collaboration with other stakeholders. We're trying to break down the silos, for example, between civil society and business, so that there's no more finger pointing, but instead true collaboration designed to move us towards solutions. And then finally, we're working on the issue of stabilization. And by stabilization, what we're essentially saying is that there are a whole series of things that you can do on climate that individually look like small steps but together add up to huge amounts of ambition. And we're doing this through something we're calling the resilience wedges approach. Previously, the message that was provided was that in order to act with urgency on climate, you needed to take a giant leap, and that that giant leap in turn required a silver bullet, either technological silver bullet or a policy silver bullet. What we're saying is that there are a series of steps that can be taken that are within your wheelhouse, that are very, very familiar to every business, that together add up to ambition. So this is what we've come up with, a very, very simple graphic to explain our wedges approach. You will see the black line is taking us towards a four degrees Celsius by the end of this century. The red line is where we need to get to in order to hold temperatures at two degrees Celsius. In other words, manageable boundaries for the climate system, manageable boundaries for business and societal resilience. If you were to get from that black line to that red line with a giant leap, it would be virtually impossible. And as a consequence, it would be disempowering for people to act. So instead of saying to people, you must take this giant leap, we're breaking it down into manageable steps. We're doing that first and foremost by explaining across eight different industry clusters that every single industry taking bold action can help contribute to solving this problem. We're trying to say that climate is no longer just about energy. It's about every industry. It's about every single company. So first of all, we're breaking down the challenge into what every different industry can do so that the burden does not just fall on the energy companies. The second thing that we're doing is we're breaking it down for each individual industry. So for example, for agriculture, we've identified a whole series of steps that can essentially be divided into two parts. One is called the supply side, one is called the demand side. And so we're now working with major agricultural companies and with governments to try and implement these different steps in collaboration. It makes it manageable, it makes it ambitious, but it also, going back to what our colleague from S&P said earlier, it makes it real and pragmatic. And because it's pragmatic, it encourages people to act. The second innovation that we're taking in this work is that we're saying that these wedges are applicable to emissions reductions, but they're also applicable to trying to build adaptive capacity, going back to the issue of managing the unavoidable. And what's very new is that we're saying here that many of the things that business is already doing, but is not related to climate, can be applicable and effective in a climate space as well. So for example, if you're working to empower your women workforce, if you're working to give them literacy on financial services and assets, you're building their capacity to be climate, uh, climate resilient. If you're working on biodiversity and ecosystem services, if you're investing in green infrastructure, you're making your operations and the communities in which you operate resilient in the face of climate. If you're looking throughout your supply chain and identifying how to reduce resource use, how to minimize energy use, you're working on climate resilience. So there are many things that companies are already doing that can be used to build resilience. And this is also a way to initiate a conversation with many companies who are traditionally quite reluctant to work on climate. There is, for example, a major energy company that doesn't really want to talk about CO2 reductions, but does wonderful work on women's empowerment and women's rights. So we can have a conversation with that company, not about emissions reductions, because they're not ready yet, but certainly about climate resilience and how we can move to work with them to re build resilience in vulnerable populations. We're going to be, over the coming months, bringing all of this to life through a series initially of research reports that are being launched. But of course, the work starts with research. It starts with understanding and insights. But as we heard earlier, it's not about talk. It's not about understanding. It's really about action. And it's also not just about action. It's about ambition. So what we're now going to do, taking this strategy forward, is we're going to tailor 
these insights and this understanding for each individual industry that we work with. We're going to identify all of the different wedges applicable to those industries and we're going to be working in partnership with our member companies to drive home this notion of ambition. And the first reports coming out on this will be during the month of June. There will be a report that we've worked on with the University of Cambridge on agriculture and a second report that we've done on extractives and primary industries. Subsequent reports will come out dealing with the financial services sector, dealing with consumer products, dealing with mining, uh, dealing with transport and logistics, all manner of different industry clusters leading up to a total of 11 reports. The message I want to leave you with before I hand over to the next speaker is really three key issues. The first is, if we really want to tackle this issue, we need to understand your specific risk. And I say your specific risk because climate risk is not a uniform taxonomy. The nature of your risk will really depend on the industry you're working in, on the geographies in which you're located. So for example, the risks you might face having your supply chain in Vietnam or in a low-lying region of Bangladesh, or in a coastal region of China, is going to be very, very different to the risk you might face if your supply chain is local, localized in dry regions such as the Sahel, Sahel in Africa, or parts of the continental United States. So it's very, very under, important to understand the specifics of the risks you're exposed to. It's also very important to understand the sensitivity of your own particular company. If you are heavily dependent on natural resources that are particularly vulnerable to climate, you have a different risk vector to a company that is not. Similarly, if your workforce is predominantly low-income women working in countries where their cultural rights, their human rights are not respected, that is very, very different to if your workforce is predominantly based in the European Union. So understanding these specifics is very, very important. And insufficient work has been done to downscale climate information from the global level to the local level. So it's very important that we do that. The second is understand how to go about building your resilience. Understand what are the specific wedges in terms of the broad suite of interventions that you can begin to initiate. And then from that broad suite, determine the ones that you really want to hone in on because they do balance this notion of ambition and pragmatism in a way that works best for you. And then the final issue is learn to collaborate with others. One of the big findings that we found last year in our survey was that there's too little collaboration inside companies between the sustainability unit, for example, and other parts of the corporation. So the first collaboration needs to be internally, particularly, for example, getting the CFO on board. The second type of collaboration needs to be looking across your peer group and finding ways to work with others in your industry who have similar risks, are facing similar problems, and may have already begun to harvest some of the lessons. The third type of collaboration is then looking beyond your comfort zone by working with others in other industries and then, of course, beginning to work more effectively with other stakeholders in government and civil society. If we can begin to take these three steps over the course of the coming years, there is a real window of opportunity for us to begin to tackle this issue with seriousness and for us to begin to replace climate risk with climate resilience. And with that, I thank you very much for your time and attention. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Rutter. I'm a manager with Ernst & Young's Climate Change and Sustainability Services Practice. Today, we'll be talking about the value of assurance readiness, looking under the hood. So before we begin, I thought I'd share a story and hope that that paints the picture of why we pursue assurance readiness. Let's say that you work at a large technology manufacturer. You're the corporate social responsibility executive tasked with reporting and uh, the reporting of your compliance with Dodd-Frank Section 1502 conflict minerals. This past Monday was the deadline and it was June 2nd. You were required to file a Form SD and a conflict mineral report. You got it in on time, everything was good. You shared some handshakes and congratulatory remarks with your team. Things were looking good. You went back to your office, were sitting at your desk when an analyst called. And that analyst began asking about why you didn't disclose smelters when everybody else did. That analyst was also asking why you didn't have a policy posted on a website. They noticed that that's required by the OECD guidance that you were supposed to adhere to. And so you think about these questions, you hang up the phone, and you get nervous that your reporting may not have been up to snuff. 
And so an assurance readiness assessment would have helped you avoid some of these questions, or at least prepare better answers for when that analyst happened to call. So when we talk about assurance readiness, we're talking about the completeness and quality of your data. So what is assurance readiness and where does it fit into the credible reporting landscape? So we had some great speakers before me. Lawrence talked about governance and setting good performance-based incentives throughout the organization, about having board level oversight so that your credible reporting areas of uh, materiality are well documented. Katie talked about what SASB is doing on materiality. Do your stakeholders have the information necessary to make proper decisions? Are you reporting on what's most important to them? We've also got to define good metrics. So let's say that you are using a lot of power. Maybe one of the things that you should be reporting on are greenhouse gases. And if you're reporting on those greenhouse gases, are you reporting on scope one, scope two, or scope three emissions? Do you have the data collection infrastructure in place? Ultimately, you want to publicly report all of that information. But before you do, you'll need, to pr you'll need to pursue at least some form of assurance if you'd like to adhere to the CDP's best practices. And so in obtaining that assurance and before you report, it's always helpful to pursue some assurance readiness to allow yourself a better comfort level with the quality and completeness of your data. And so when we talk about assurance readiness, what kinds of tasks will we be going through? What will we do to achieve that completeness and quality? Well, one of the first things that we'll do is we'll complete a walkthrough of your key processes and the reporting infrastructure uh, supporting them. Maybe we'll perform some site visits, go and speak with individuals who have to carry those procedures. We'll trace information from your report back to the source data, look at meter readings and invoices and things like that. Uh, inevitably, we'll have to do some analytical procedures. We'd have to look at what you reported last year in this. So for example, if you're reporting 100 million tons of carbon were emitted last year, and this year uh, you've made an improvement, you're only emitting about 80 million tons, what caused that change? What can you point to in your organization to say, hey, we've improved efficiency and that's why we're dropping emissions by 20 million tons? That kind of discussion would be had in order to make sure that the quality and the data match up. So assurance readiness is by no means a, a formal form of assurance. You wouldn't be able to report to the CDP that you uh, pursued assurance readiness and therefore the, the numbers are good. You wouldn't be able to uh, associate an Ernst & Young necessarily with that information. That said, the benefit is all of that information that you gather in a findings and recommendations report that would follow an assurance readiness assessment would allow you to make the changes behind the scenes out of the spotlight before somebody calls you on it. The next step after assurance readiness would likely be a review. Uh, the AICPA defines a review as limited assurance or negative assurance. An assurance statement would read something like, nothing came to our attention that would lead us to believe that these metrics are not material, materially stated in non-material respects. The next level after that would be an examination, positive assurance, whereby you would have an auditor opine on your metrics and that auditor would say something like, these metrics are reported correctly in all material respects. It tends to be the most expensive. It is the best practice right now in the world of sustainability, reviews being the most common and required by organizations like the CDP. So assurance readiness looks at two things. It's going to look at the individual metrics that you've got out there or the subject matter. So again, using greenhouse gases as our proxy, we would say that scope one, scope two, scope three emissions are your metrics. Supporting those and the methodologies and, and the like would be the criteria. Typically, we look for credible third-party sources to establish that criteria. You do have the option of using custom criteria to define some of your metrics. If you are designing your own criteria, we look for certain attributes as defined by the AICPA. Those, those attributes are objectivity, measurability, completeness, and relevance. Essentially, we're trying to remove all bias from the calculation when reporting out to the market. So what's driving credible reporting and the associated need for assurance readiness? We've put, we've put a few examples up on the board to help paint the picture. Um, 
A 2011 Harvard study identified that ESG data on Bloomberg terminals over three bi-monthly periods received nearly 44 million web hits. And that dovetails very nicely with the, the graphic up on the board. We're seeing that on average, uh, users are using this ESG data um, at a 47 point, <laughs> the increase in usage is about 47.7% each year. It's pretty clear that this environmental and social governance data is being used in the evaluation process. Before me, Evan Harvey spoke a lot about what the exchanges are doing and how, at least at the voluntary level, we're seeing that ESG data is being demanded. But we've also got regulatory bodies, like the California Air Resource Board, looking for more disclosure around your emissions. We've got the US SEC Interpretive Guidance on Climate Change Risk Disclosure. We're also seeing elements of social compliance, like Dodd-Frank, Section 1502. And so the demand for ESG data and the quality therein is certainly being driven by the exchanges and by public entities. So who else is driving this demand for assurance readiness, assurance, and credible reporting? This slide really talks to the fact that shareholders, activist shareholders in particular, are getting more excited about what you're doing in the social and governance and environmental sphere. You see that the support for these proposals is growing. And we also see that the category itself, so social and governance and environmental factors, are making up about 60% of those shareholder proposals in the current year. That's up from 45% during the same time last year. And of the top 10 most demanded environmental and social disclosures, coming in at number eight, we see a demand that companies begin talking about global labor practices and human rights. At number four, they'd like to see a sustainability report. And the second most demanded in the shareholder proposals is a review or report on your greenhouse gases. So then we begin to think about what this means for your individual company or business. Your first question is likely, where is my company? And so you might be a non-reporter today, and there might be a good reason why. You might be a middle-of-the-pack reporter or even a differentiator. But in order to answer that question, what is my current state, theoretically you could pursue assurance readiness. You'd line up what protocol or what guidance you'd like to be following and figure out if you can report out with confidence. Some of you might feel as though you're a middle-of-the-pack or a differentiator. You have a lot in, in the public sphere. If that's the case, again, can you stand behind all of that data? Our anecdote in the beginning, you know, if you are reporting on conflict minerals, do you feel strongly about having your CFO or CEO sign off on that report? Having the information out there is, is good, but having the quality behind it is even better. And if you are going to pursue that differentiator status, you might consider some other things. So sure, you want to be ready, but are you a B2B, a B2C? If you're B2C, more likely you're going to be facing some customer pressure, some public disclosure, and public ire if you do fall afoul of the expectations. At the end of the day, no matter where you are in the spectrum, board level oversight and governance would help. And I'm pretty sure that your board would want to know what level of quality they can count on when they're speaking with you. So what does it mean, again, for my business? So we put a few questions up on the board and a few statements that we have seen or have adapted for the purposes of our discussion today. A statement like, we've reduced the amount of waste in our supply chain by 50%. That's great. But supply chain is pretty ambiguous. Are we talking about upstream companies? Are we talking about downstream companies? Are we exclusively talking about the operations within your walls, within your sites? If we're talking about assurance readiness, we could look at that statement and try to parse out some of that detail and figure out what systems, can, what systems are available, what processes currently support your own internal reporting, and maybe some questionnaires can be developed for what can be asked abroad. You might also see statements like, confirm all agricultural products have originated from some sustainable sources by 2020. What are sustainable sources? Are we talking about non-genetically modified organisms? Are we talking about organics? Putting a definition there, putting some criteria behind it, would certainly help you evaluate your own performance against that statement. We've also seen very broad statements made, like improve the quality of life for 10 million people, or reduce childhood obesity. There are ways to measure and put metrics to those, those data points. 
If you want to talk about nutritional standards, you could say, hey, I've switched out some of that traditional barbecue fare like french fries and put apples and fresh fruit and, and vegetables in our, in our meals. How many meals were sold? Maybe that contributes to the, the, the goal of improving the lives of 10 million people. So add some tangibility to that information. Again, when we talk about criteria, it should be objective, measurable, complete, and relevant to your stakeholders. So we like to talk about some common pitfalls. What goes wrong as people go out to the market and try to report credibly? Well, inevitably, there's a lack of dedicated resources. You just don't have the money or the personnel to do it. Others have said that uh, they weren't able to make commitments based on good data. There weren't processes in place, or there were poorly constructed calculation and estimation methodologies. If you think about it, right now you're collecting data on all of your electricity usage, but are you pulling the kilowatt hours directly from those invoices, or are you just pulling the dollars and cents? You need the kilowatt hours to then apply factors to determine what the emissions are throughout the geographies of the country. So some common pitfalls are listed. Assurance readiness could help you figure out which ones apply. And so when we talk to practitioners within the walls of their own companies, we talk about what drives sustainability assurance and the need for these readiness assessments for you. And you see some of the, the examples up on the board, like providing comfort to my management or avoiding the trust crisis, keeping pace with my peers. But in 2012, in our 2012 survey at least, we found that the top reason, 47% of respondents stated that it adds credibility to the information presented in the eyes of its stakeholders. So if you think about what Evan was, was discussing before and Katie and Lawrence, that we really are trying to put the right information out so that our stakeholders can make the right decision about our company. Investors can decide whether or not they want to invest with us or not. And so I appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you do have any questions about assurance readiness, we'll certainly be up, uh, up here on the panel. Uh, we've got some good information and uh, documentation available on our website. Thanks again. Uh, the first question, how does EY evaluate the readiness of companies to begin the process of, ass of assuring data? So the first thing that we'd likely do is interview folks who have this responsibility, the, the data owners, the, the process, the data custody holders, the process owners, to figure out if they've got um, a good handle on where they're going to pull the data from themselves. I mean, ideally, you start with some sort of materiality assessment to understand if they're reporting the right things. but. We are more often engaged uh, on a more narrow basis to look at something like carbon, water, nutritional commitments, so on and so forth. Um, but certainly interview folks to, to get a sense of data and then perform those walkthroughs to figure out how they're aggregating and consolidating across the organization, different geographies, so on and so forth. So I've been given a number of very, very pointed political questions. <laughs> and when I answer them, I'm likely to get into trouble. So let's jump in and answer some of them. Um, this, this is a good one. Global warming is the greatest risk to human civilizations ever faced, and by extension to business. How can business bring pressure to bear on large corporations to counter climate denial a la the Koch brothers? Being Irish, I can say I have no idea who the Koch brothers are. Um, I, I think there's two ways in which, uh, maybe three ways in which business needs to get in, involved in this. Um, the first is, something that I've perceived relatively recent, which is a lack of sufficient business-to-business -business demand. Business tends to get a lot of demand from civil society, and it tends to get, obviously, demand from government, from regulations, etc., and legislation. But I have found in the collaborative conversations we've initiated that there's a reluctant, reluctance to pressure each other. So, for example, we hosted a meeting where we had a series of major ICT companies present, and we were suggesting to them that they are major consumers of energy, <coughs> And as a consequence, they have power as consumers. And I recall one person in the room saying, we wouldn't go in, we wouldn't want a major energy company telling us how to design a mainframe computer, so we're not going to tell them how to design their energy product. Now, subsequently, the conversation moved on from there, and there was a really healthy debate within the room. But that struck me as being really important, that if we don't have more business-to-business -business demand asking for a better product from the carbon-intensive industries, then we're going to struggle to get this challenge actually addressed. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing, I think, is 
that there is a policy environment on climate being shaped all around us right as we speak. There are 96 countries around the world who have initiated carbon reduction policies. Some of them are market-based mechanisms, some of them are legislation. Some of them are good, some of them are really, really bad. They're dreadfully written, they're poorly implemented. So this is happening and it is inevitable that more policy is going to come. If it can't come through Congress, the President will use executive authority. If it doesn't come at the federal level, it will come at the municipal or state level. It is inevitable that we're going to deal with this. So what business should be doing is moving away from a mode of resisting the inevitable and instead being more actively involved in shaping a more effective policy enabling environment since it will be shaped one way or the other. And then the third thing I would say is that there's a moment for business to be vocal on this issue and that moment has arrived. IKEA, for example, reaches 40 million consumers every week and they are now beginning to communicate out to their consumers about climate. We see more and more of this happening in the consumer uh, product sector where the companies are beginning to speak actively, openly, energetically about climate, why it's important, how consumers need to change their lifestyle, etc. Some of these companies are doing it because they're fundamentally aware of the risk. A major subsidiary of Walmart in the UK called Asda recently reported that 95% of their fresh produce is at risk from climate. So of course it's there in their interest to speak about this, but we need to have more and more companies doing, doing the same. Sure. So one of the questions uh, uh, put forth here, how much of the EY engagement process is focused on data improvement rather than data disclosure? I think this is a great question because you know, when we talked about readiness assessment a second ago, those are the types of engagements that can be customized, right? So the scope uh, can be written to suit your needs. So if you want to be very narrow uh, and really develop an understanding of your processes and systems, that can be done. Typically when we go beyond assurance readiness and we talk about completing a review or an examination, which according to our professional standards requires that public disclosure on our findings, um, we have a little bit less leeway. That said, you will have uh, typically a findings and recommendations report or a management letter that would follow such an engagement and would tell you about what we found to be very good about your processes or that was perhaps in need of some form of improvement. So, um, you know, long story short, assurance readiness is great because it's a report that you get without that public back end um, and it can be customized. So most EY engagements will provide some level of, of quality improvement in them. Uh, whether it's explicit or implicit. I have another question here about um, climate denial, so I'll answer this one as a follow-up to the last one. What do you think are the driving forces behind those scientists and organizations that refuse to believe in the possibility of global warming and climate change? So m my response to that is that I, I think it's very important to differentiate amongst the huge group of people who are failing to act right now. Because within the spectrum of people who are failing to take action, there are those who are not acting because they don't understand the risk. There are those who are not acting because they haven't yet been introduced to a strategy for building resilience. There are those who are acting, but they're not acting with sufficient ambition. All of these are very, very legitimate reasons for inaction, and we need to help those people to actually move the needle. Then, of course, there is a smaller subset of people who fail to believe that this is actually a reality. And I always find this absolutely stupefying because if an aviation engineer were to tell you that 97% of all aviation engineers think that there's a 95% chance that the plane you're getting on tomorrow morning will crash, you would have to be, pardon my language, moronic to get on that plane. And yet we are faced with the same uh, issue globally on climate change. There is no dispute in the science. There is consensus. Similarly, Imagine how difficult it is to get the governments of Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, the United States, Russia, and all 196 countries around the world, with the exception of North Korea, to agree on any issue under the sun. And yet every single one of those governments agrees that we need to hold temperatures below two degrees Celsius, and every single one of them is about to sign up to a new treaty at the end of next year. So the notion that there is dispute is, is really a false notion, but I think what we really need to do is to separate people who are, uh, frankly, protecting their own self-interest from a much wider group of people who simply need to be animated and empowered to act. And I think if we do animate and empower the majority to act, we will soon find that those climate deniers are being um, ostracized and their powerful voices are becoming less powerful over time. 
So there's two questions on this card. Number one, in your assurance work, how do you see most companies define supply chain for audit purposes? Is there a best third-party definition? And then the next question, which, which actually fits nicely, what metrics most often fail assurance definition tests? And I can say on the first part, we're not seeing a, uh, a critical mass of companies adhering to one supply chain standard. With the exclusion of conflict minerals, which focused on tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold in the supply chain, uh, there, there's not a, a criteria or methodology out there that we can lean on. And so in that second question, what metrics often fail assurance definition tests? I would say it's not that they fail so much as they're not necessarily completed as of now. So if you look at supply chain, we have the example up on the board that we're going to reduce waste in our supply chain by 50%. That's great, but the custom criteria behind that, what does that mean? You know, is it truly objective? Are we talking about just what's in, with, within our own walls? Um, is it relevant? Is it com uh, complete? Um, is it measurable? Those types of questions that we'll ask about metrics don't have answers as of yet. And so supply chain was the, the leading question, you know, what is a, a sustainable supply chain? You know, you do have some leeway, you can define that, but the, the place where most companies are falling short right now is building the right definitions to report out in a way that is comparable year over year. So I have um, a number of questions which are quite similar, so rather than read them out, I'll just give a synopsis of what they're getting at. These two questions are both asking about what are the short-term incentives that can be put in place in order to drive action forward. And this one is really about how do we manage uh, conflicts, uh, difficult choices and trade-offs that need to be made. So on the issue of uh, short-term wins, essentially, I would say that there's a number of things we need to do. First of all, I think we need to focus in on what are the areas where the most ambition can be generated. And those areas are essentially how we use land and how we use energy. <coughs> There are all manner of other things that we can do that are important, but fundamentally they're the two biggest things that need to be addressed. So for example, on the energy side of it, it's very important that we tackle energy use by conserving more, by being more efficient, and it's also extremely important that we tackle the mix in our energy supply, that we're not only relying on fossil fuels, but that we're beginning to transition towards the use of more renewable energy sources. Um, on the other side of the equation, I would say there's some fundamental business practices that need to be changed. One of the things that Paul Pullman did at Unilever when he came in was he abolished quarterly reporting for that company. And he said that the reason he did it in his first 100 days is because he, his rationale was they can't fire me within the first 100 days, so I'm going to do it now while I'm in my honeymoon period and then we'll see how it progresses. And he has found that as a consequence of doing that, there's far more leeway for him to take a longer term perspective on how to manage the company and how to report out on what the company is doing. Uh, similarly, there has been a huge decline in research and development investments at the corporate level and also at the government level over the course of the last 25 years. So there is a great need for us to reinvest in research and development so that we can begin to develop low carbon products, low carbon technologies, different types of business models, different types of interfaces with consumers and customers, uh, in order to develop some of the solutions that are going to be uh, necessary for this. So I would say in the short term we need to look at some of the perverse incentives that are in place that prevent us from acting well and we also need to have quick wins on energy and land. And then this other question is about conflicts of interest. Um, it talks about, for example, companies that are investing in, in, in GMOs. I think there's a, a bigger conflict of interest right now or, or difficult choice that needs to be made which is what do we do about energy? There has been a movement away from nuclear power, for example, over the course of the last 20 years. And now there's a whole number of people who are beginning to move back towards nuclear because they're saying it's, it's low carbon. And while we don't have a way of dealing with nuclear waste, the immediate priority is to tackle uh, emissions from fossil fuels and nuclear is ready to go and it provides an alternative. The reality is there are going to be very, very difficult trade-offs that we have to make in dealing with this issue. And it's, I think, um, inconsistent for us to pretend otherwise. There are trade-offs between security of energy, affordability of energy, access to energy in the short term while similarly moving away from fossil fuels towards renewable energies. There is a trade-off and a difficult choice that needs to be made about reinserting nuclear into the power mix at a time when we still haven't figured out how to deal with, with nuclear waste. There are questions around the use of fertilizers and GMOs at a time when the global population is rising and climate change is putting pressure on food supply. So there are no easy answer to this question, but I think the one thing we must do 
is recognise that as a group of people we need to do a better job of understanding complexity and of translating this into practical action. And it, and it won't be easy, but it is necessary. I think that's a wrap. I think we're good. Yeah. Time? All right. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Yep. Thank you, Matt, and, and thank you, Cameron. Um, very interesting to hear the deeper dive into the, the subject matter that we all discussed this morning about climate changes, insights about assurance, how the two tie together. I like this weave that we're getting. Uh, this tapestry that we're getting from this morning into this afternoon, and in, in, I guess we're still in the morning, but um, it's all tying together nicely. Um, and of course, how businesses are preparing for the monitoring that's involved in everything that we're talking about. Uh, so thank you very much.